formula for consecrated living. This morning we thought we'd talk for a few minutes. We'd consider, actually, from the words of the Apostle Paul in Romans, the 12th chapter, the formula for consecrated living that he gives to us. He begins his advice with the familiar words of Romans 12, verses 1 and 2. But we're going to do something different this morning. We're going to read Romans 12 from the Phillips translation. We had an opportunity of studying this a few months back, and we were really impressed with the language that Phillips uses because we think it's, it sort of captures some very important nuances of the Apostle Paul's advice to us. So Romans 12, beginning with verse 1. With eyes wide open to the mercies of God, I beg you, my brothers, as an intelligent act of worship, to give him your bodies as a living sacrifice, consecrated to him and acceptable by him. Don't let the world around you squeeze you into its own mold, but let God remake you so that your whole attitude of mind is changed. Thus you will prove in practice that the will of God is good, acceptable to him, and perfect. Romans 12, 1 and 2 is really a summary statement of our entire Christian walk. Romans 12, 1 describes the sacrifice of our justified humanity, justified by our faith in the blood of Jesus. Romans 12, 2 talks about the work of sanctification, the growth and development of of the new creature into the likeness of Christ. In the rest of Romans 12, Paul goes on to explain in detail what he meant in verses 1 and 2. And so Paul begins his explanation in verse 3 with these words. As your spiritual teacher, I, by the grace of God, gave me, give this advice to each of you. Paul starts his advice in verse 3 by talking about humility. And he writes it in these words coming from Phillips. He says, don't cherish exaggerated ideas of yourself or your importance, but try to have a sane estimate of your capabilities by the light of the faith that God has given to you all. There was a very important reason why Paul starts his advice on consecrated living with the characteristic of humility. Humility is not just the foundation for making a consecration. It's also the foundation for living a consecrated life. That's why the Apostle Peter wrote in 1 Peter 5.5, 5, he says, Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another. For God opposes the proud, gives grace to the humble. We are to be clothed with humility. Meaning that at any direction that somebody looks at us in our lives, what they should see is humility. We cannot carry out our living sacrifice nor will we allow God to mold us into the image of his Son unless we have humility. And our Lord, in his earthly ministry, emphasized the crucial nature of humility by mentioning it first in his Sermon on the Mount, and he told us it was a requirement for entering the kingdom of heaven. Matthew 5, 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The next thing that Paul mentions after humility is he reminds us that the body of Christ has many members. It's not just us. Paul writes, For just as you have many members in one physical body, and those members differ in their functions, so we though many in number compose one body in Christ, and all are members one of another. God has called the members of the church from all nations and peoples and languages. 
He's called them from all socioeconomic levels and all ethnic backgrounds. As Paul writes later in this epistle, 1 Corinthians 12, excuse me, 1 Corinthians 12, 18, he says, God has set the members, every one of them in the body, as it hath pleased him. The body of Christ is a cooperative group. It's working together to build one another up in the likeness of Christ, helping one another in the doing of God's will. And it's our responsibility to accept and to embrace each member of the body as fellow members of God's spiritual family because it's the Heavenly Father who has chosen them for us. Paul continues his formula in Romans, the 12th chapter, in verse 6, with, with these words. He says, Through the grace of God, we have different gifts. If our gift is preaching, let us preach to the limit of our vision. We found it very interesting that when we looked at the original Greek, which is translated gifts, it's actually the word charisma. And charisma means a divine gratuity or a spiritual endowment. And we're going to find here now in verses 6 through 8 of Romans, the 12th chapter, that the gifts that Paul is talking about are the talents and abilities that we have that can and should be used in the service of the Lord, the truth, and the brethren. And Paul here begins by exhorting us to use whatever talents and whatever abilities we have to the very limit of our capacity. The first gift he talks about is preaching. Actually, preaching is translated from a Greek word, Strong's number 4394. The word is prophetaria, and it means prophecy or prediction. Now, Paul tells us something interesting in 1 Corinthians 14.22 about prophecy. He says prophecy is intended for believers. Prophecy was designed by God to alert the brethren about what was going to happen and how they should be prepared for it and respond to it when it really did occur. And so all down through the gospel age, prophecies have alerted the brethren to the rise of false teachers so they wouldn't be ensnared by them. The rise of the false system that we heard about yesterday in Brother Joe's discourse on Revelation 13. Prophecies also alerted to, to the brethren and especially Brother Russell, about the signs marking our Lord's return and the events marking the end of the age. The gift of prophecy is not given by God as a measurement either of spiritual development or a measurement of spiritual superiority. Prophecy was designed by God to forewarn the brethren so that we all might not be taken in a snare. Today, prophecy refers to the review and the understanding of those predictions that were written thousands of years ago and recorded for us in the scriptures. And as Paul tells us in 1 Timothy 1.18, prophecy is given to us that we might all war a good warfare. And so if understanding prophecy is one of the skills that we possess, let us use it to the benefit of all of our brethren that we might war a good warfare. Paul continues his list of gifts in Romans, the 12th chapter, in verse 7, with these words. If it is serving others, let us concentrate on our service. If it is teaching, let us give all that we have to our teaching. Now, the scriptures clearly indicate to us that the gift of service is not restricted to apostles, or elders, or even brothers. The church at Thyatira was praised for its service. The disciples at Antioch provided service to the brethren at Jerusalem. And it was zealous service by the brethren at Acacia that provoked many to copy it. Almost everyone can participate in some way, large or small, in the service of the truth and the brethren. All it takes is a willing heart and a desire to work. 
One of the most important gifts for building up the church is the gift of teaching. And our Lord Jesus is perhaps the best role model we have of teaching people about God's plan and his wonderful character. We're told in Matthew 7.29 that when Jesus taught during his earthly ministry, he taught the people as one having authority and not as the scribes. What did Jesus teach? He taught the gospel of the kingdom. He taught the terms and conditions of discipleship. He taught the signs of his return. These are the same things we should be teaching to one another, and we should be witnessing to the world. And as the Apostle Paul tells us in Colossians 3.16, we all have the responsibility to teach. Paul writes, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. The next gift Paul mentions is Romans 12 and verse 8, where he says, And if our gifts be the stimulating of the faith of others, let us set ourselves to it. Stimulating the faith is translated from Strong's number 3870. Parakleo means to call near, to invite, to implore or exhort. And this Greek word and this concept of stimulating or exhorting is so important, we find it used 107 times in the scriptures. And exhortation begins with God. That's what the Apostle Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 1.4, because we find that same Greek word used four times in this passage of scripture. And it really means exhortation. God exhorts us in all of our tribulation so that we may be able to exhort them which are in any trouble by the exhortation wherewith we ourselves are exhorted of God. We are expected to pass on to others the exhortation, the stimulation of our faith that we receive from our Heavenly Father. How do we stimulate the faith of our brother? Through conversation and communication with our brother. That's how we stimulate them. We do it through cards and letters and phone calls and emails to those brethren who are far away from us, perhaps on the other side of the country or in a different country. And we exhort through, through meetings and fellowships the brethren who are near, who we see often. But we cannot exhort those with whom we do not meet, or those with whom we do not communicate. As the Apostle Paul tells us, he says, exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. The next gift that Paul talks about in Romans 12.8 is the gift of giving. Paul says, let the man who is called to give Give freely. Our giving is to be done freely, with sincerity, without self-seeking or without ulterior motives. Paul tells us in Ephesians 4.32 that one of the reasons we work, and he's talking about secular work, is so that we have something to give to others who might be less fortunate than ourselves. And our giving is not just physical, it's also spiritual. Paul talked about it in Romans 1.11 where he desired to give the brethren at Rome a spiritual gift so that they could be established in the faith. And we should follow Paul's example. Paul also tells us what the motivation of this giving should be. It should be based on our love for one another. That's what Paul's giving was based on as he tells us in 1 Thessalonians 2.8. He says, for the Thessalonian brethren, he had such a fond affection for them that he was well pleased to impart to them not only the gospel, but his own life. Because the brethren there at Thessalonica had become so dear to him. Let's follow Paul's example. And give to one another not only the gospel, but our own lives. Because we love 
one another. Paul mentions in Romans 12.8 how the ecclesia leader should work. He says in Romans 12, he says, let the man in authority work with enthusiasm. We're going to suggest that those in authority that Paul is talking about is not just the elders, and not just the deacons, and not just the brethren. But they're the spiritually mature and wise brothers and sisters in the ecclesia. And these are to work with diligence and enthusiasm for the benefit of the entire ecclesia, and especially the younger and the less mature. Paul confirms this for us in Romans 15, 1, when he says, Ye who are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak, and not to please yourselves. And Paul adds in 1 Thessalonians 5, 14, he says, We exhort you, brethren, encourage the faint-hearted, Help the weak and be patient with them all. The last gift that Paul mentions in Romans 12 is the gift of sympathy or compassion. And he says, let the man who feels sympathy for his fellows in distress, help them cheerfully. You know, during his first advent, many who approached Jesus and were wanting to be healed asked him for his compassion. The two blind men asked Jesus to have compassion on him. And the woman of Cana asked Jesus to have compassion on her daughter and heal her. Compassion, sympathy, should be perhaps the easiest of the gifts for each one of us to demonstrate. For we have all received God's compassion and sympathy in being forgiven our sins. We are now the people of God because we have obtained God's mercy or his sympathy or his compassion. Remember in the parable of the unmerciful servant, the Lord in the parable tells the servant, should not have you had mercy on your fellow slave in the same way I had mercy on you. Now, Paul tells us if we feel sympathy for our brethren, we should take action. We should help those in distress cheerfully. And our Lord added sympathy or compassion to one of the terms and conditions of discipleship in his Sermon on the Mount. Blessed are the sympathetic, for they shall obtain sympathy. Matthew 5, 7. Think of the seven gifts that the Apostle Paul has just mentioned. Prophecy, service, teaching, stimulating the faith of others or exhortation, giving, leading enthusiastically, sympathy or compassion. How many of these gifts require special skills? For us to possess them. Maybe just two. Maybe just prophecy. Maybe just leading. The rest require just two things for us to possess them as a gift. A willing heart and a desire to work. Apostle Paul continues his formula for consecrated living in verse 9 of the 12th chapter. He says, let us have no imitation Christian love. Let us have a genuine hatred for evil and a real devotion to good. Paul is telling us our agape love must be sincere, not an imitation. And then Paul goes on to describe what that sincere agape love is like. He tells us, first of all, it detests evil and is devoted to that which is good. Brother Russell writes this in reprint 2213. He says we should intensely impose the untrue, the impure, the sinful. Sin and selfishness and the spirit of the world should be distressing and repugnant to us. Intense opposition to evil is a vital part of agape love. But it should be first focused on ourselves, on the faults and the flaws 
and the weaknesses we find in our hearts and in our minds. Paul also said that this love included a real devotion to doing good. And it's really interesting. We found that this word devotion is really translated from a Greek word, kaleo. And it means to glue, to stick together. Paul's telling us that we should stick like glue to that which is good. It's like John tells us in 3 John, verse 11. He says, Beloved, follow not that which is evil, but that which is good. He that doeth good is of God, but he that doeth evil has not seen God. And the Apostle Peter confirms this in 1 Peter 3, verses 10 and 11, when he says, For one who desires life to love and to see good days, he must turn away from evil meaning everything not approved or in harmony with God, and do good. He must seek peace and pursue it. And then in verse 10, Paul continues to define for us this true Christian or agape love. He says, let us have a real warm affection for one another as between brothers, and a willingness to let the other man have the credit. The NASB translates the first part of this verse, be devoted to one another in brotherly love. And this concept of brotherly love, a really warm affection, is translated from Strong's number 5387, which means cherishing one's kindred, particularly one's love for one's parents or love for one's children. We are to cherish our brethren as if they were members of our own family. Because they are. They are members of our spiritual family. Brotherly love means cherishing our brethren. Apostle Paul wrote in 1 Thessalonians 4.9, he says, Touching brotherly love, you don't have need that I write unto you. You are taught of God yourselves to love one another. Much of what we find in the scriptures, God is through his word and his example, through the example of Jesus and Jesus' teachings, he's telling us the importance of loving our brethren with the divine or agape love. Apostle John tells us in 1 John 4.20, he says, If you don't love your brother who you have seen, how can you love God who you have not seen? And in 1 Peter 1.22, the Apostle tells us that brotherly love comes from obeying the truth. Peter writes, seeing that you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned, unto sincere love of the brethren. You know, it's very interesting. Peter's giving us a measuring stick here of how to measure ourselves on how well we're obeying the truth. And that is... How much do we love our brother? Brotherly love also means a willingness to let the other man have the credit. That's what Paul says in Romans 12, 10. I'm sure you've all heard this statement. It's amazing what can be accomplished when we don't care who gets the credit. Humility is the key to letting others have the credit. And we notice now this is the second time in this epistle that Paul has talked about humility. Well, Paul repeats this concept of letting others have the credit in first, or, or, excuse me, Philippians 2, verse 3. He says, With humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves. And so Paul is telling us really here, he says, Let our brethren have the credit and trust God that he knows how much credit we deserve, if any. Paul continues in Romans 12, verse 11, and he says, Let not allow slackness to spoil our work, and let us keep the fires of the Spirit burning as we do our work for the Lord. 
The Greek word translated slackness or slothful in business in the King James really means to be tardy in speed. And the Bible in better English translates this part of the verse, be not slow in your work, but be quick in the spirit as the Lord's servants. We are to be quick in doing the Lord's will. In the parable of the talents, the one talent servant who hid his talent in the earth is described by the Lord as not just being wicked, but he was slothful. He was tardy. He was slow. Let's not let that be descriptive of us. To avoid slackness or tardiness, the Apostle Paul exhorts us in Romans 12, 11, to keep the fires of the Spirit burning. Or as the Revised Standard translates this phrase, to be aglow with the Spirit. Fervency in serving God comes from a rich indwelling of God's Holy Spirit in our hearts and our minds. And the greater the measure of God's Spirit we have, the greater will be our fervency. Paul tells us in Romans 12, 12, that we base our happiness on our hope in Christ. Our happiness is to be spiritually based, not on the things of this earth. And to do that, Jesus told us in Matthew 6, verses 20 and 21, lay not up for yourselves treasures, or lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through to steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also, and that's where our happiness will be. When our treasure is based in heaven, then the trials and the difficulties of this life cannot touch it. And hence, they can't affect our happiness because it's based beyond their grasp in heaven, in the promises of God. Paul continues this formula in Romans 12, 12 with the words, and when trials come, and they will come, endure them patiently. Steadfastly maintain the habit of prayer. Basing our happiness in Christ, beyond the veil, in heaven, will enable us to endure these difficult experiences patiently. Endure them patiently is actually translated from a Greek, which means to persevere under pressure. The pressure that transforms us, our character, into the likeness of Christ. You know, just like heat and pressure transforms ordinary carbon into a diamond, heat and pressure of trial transforms us, transforms our character into that of Christ if we endure, if we persevere. Paul tells us that this pressure is a light affliction which is but for a moment, but works in us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. But for the process to reach its successful conclusion, we must persevere under the pressure. And Paul tells us that to persevere under this trial, one of the things we must do is steadfastly maintain a habit of prayer. Prayer is our lifeline for divine guidance, for God's overruling, for his help in every time of need. And we have many admonitions in the scriptures to take advantage of our lifeline. Paul tells us to come boldly unto the throne of grace so that we can obtain both mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Hebrews 4.16 Paul also tells us that we should... Continually use this life. I never let go of it. 1 Thessalonians 5.17 Pray without ceasing. 
This prayer, this, this lifeline also provides the divine assistance we need to overcome our three enemies, particularly the weaknesses of the flesh. As our Lord told Peter and the disciples, and he told us, Matthew 26, 41, watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And then Paul tells us that we need to back up that prayer with action because in verse 13 he says, Give freely to fellow Christians in want, never grudging them a meal or a bed to those who need them. You know, this is consistent with the thought that we are to lay down our lives for our brethren. That's how we demonstrate our love for them. You know, Apostle John said in 1 John 3.16, he said, we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. And then he sort of poses a question to give us an example of how to do that. He says, if anyone has the world good and sees his brother in need and yet doesn't help him, closes his heart against him, he says, how does God's love abide in that individual? He says, little children, let us not love in word or in speech but in deed and in truth. Love affects not just the words. It affects our actions. You know, ministering to our brethren is how we would show Christ our love if he were in our midst. And sharing what we have with our brethren is really appropriate because what we have actually belongs to the Lord. We gave it to him at consecration. Paul tells us about the example of the churches of Macedonia in this regard in 2 Corinthians 8, verses 3 and 4, reading from the Rise Standard. He talks about the brethren in Macedonia, and he said, They gave according to their means, as I can testify, and beyond their means of their own free will. And they begged us earnestly for the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints. Those brethren there rejoiced. And not just rejoiced at the opportunity of helping their brethren, they begged the apostle for a chance to help their less fortunate brethren. We should do the same thing. Apostle Peter confirms this for us in 1 Peter 4 and verse 10. He said, as each has received a gift, employ it for one another as good stewards of God's very grace. Let us be good stewards by what, for what God has put in our hands and use it for the benefit of others. And then Paul goes on in Romans 12, verses 14 and 17 and 19 and 20 to describe how we should treat our enemies. Beginning with verse 14, he says, And for those who try to make your life a misery, bless them. Don't curse, bless. Don't pay back a bad turn by a bad turn to anyone. Never take vengeance into your own hands, my dear friends. Stand back and let God punish if he will. For it is written, Vengeance belongeth unto me. I will recompense, saith the Lord. And it is written, If thy enemy hunger, feed him. And if he thirst, give him a drink. For in so doing thou shalt heap coals of fire upon his head. In these verses, Paul is telling us to bless our enemies. And Jesus gave us the same thought in Matthew 5, 44. When in the Sermon on the Mount, he said, Love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do get good to them that hate you. Pray for them who despitefully use you and persecute you. Bless actually means to speak well of or to really invoke a benediction upon. And all of this is part of loving our enemies. And that means we don't hate our enemies. We don't return evil to them. Nor do we seek revenge for the evil they bring into our lives. 
We don't love their evil actions, but we love what they will become in Christ's kingdom. Earthly sons of God, once they have their blindness taken away, and they have that opportunity to walk up the way of holiness and have their hearts and their characters transformed into the likeness of the Lord's, just as what's taking place in our lives now. Instead of returning evil for evil, we give them food and drink, both literally and spiritually. And Paul tells us that will heap coals of fire upon their heads. Adam Clark, in his commentary, suggests that heaping coals of fire is a metaphor for the smelting of metals, where the fire was put both above and below the ore to liquefy the metal and separate it from the dross. And so artists melt the sullen ore of lead by heaping coals of fire upon its head. In the kind warmth the metal learns to glow and pure from dross the silver runs below. In Christ's kingdom, our enemies will remember that we return to them love for the evil they practice to us. And that coals of fire from above them will work together with the environment of the kingdom to melt their stony hearts and refine their character and shape it into a likeness of the Heavenly Father. Next, the Apostle Paul exhorts us to share the happiness of those who are happy and the sorrow of those who are sad. You know, this reminds us of the statement that happiness shared is happiness multiplied and sorrow shared is sorrow halved. And it takes agape love to rejoice in the success of others and to bear the sorrows of others. As Paul tells us in Galatians 6, to bear ye one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. This is the royal law of love. And then in Romans 12, verses 16 and 18, Paul exhorts us to live in harmony and peace. Live in harmony with each other, he says. Don't become snobbish, but take a real interest in ordinary people. Don't become set in your own opinions. As far as your responsibility goes, live at peace with everyone. In these verses, Paul is telling us how to live in harmony and peace with our brethren. First thing he says is, be humble. Or as the NASB translates this part of the verse, don't be haughty in mind. You know, if we're not humble, then our opinions and our desires are going to get in the way of good relations with our brethren. Second thing Paul tells us about in these two verses, he says, associate with those and that which is humble. Or as Weymouth translates this part of the verse, let humble ways content you. You know, if we associate with, if we focus on that which is humble, it makes it a whole lot easier to live in peace and harmony with one another. And the third thing Paul says in these verses, he says, don't become fixed, don't become rigid, don't become arrogant in our opinions. Or as the contemporary English version translates, he says, don't be proud and feel that you're smarter than others. When we're rigid in our thinking, we make it very difficult for the Lord to teach us anything new or to change us into the likeness of Christ. Notice this is the third time in this chapter Paul has talked about the importance of humility in living a consecrated life. I think we see a theme here emerging about how essential humility is to living that consecrated life. You know, Paul puts the responsibility of living peaceably on us 
We're to do the utmost to live peaceably with one another, regardless of what anybody else does. Regardless of what our brethren do, what those in the world do. You know, Paul mentions his responsibility in 2 Corinthians 13 and verse 11, where he says, live in peace and the God of love and peace will be with you. If we want the God of love and peace to live with us, we must live in peace with one another. And Paul is really telling us here in these verses that a lack of peace really indicates a spirit of carnality. For strife comes from the flesh, not from the spirit. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 3.3, he says, Where there's jealousy and strife among you, are you not fleshly? And are you not walking like mere men? Paul's telling us here in Romans 12 that a lack of peace really comes from a lack of humility and really a lack of the spirit as well. He tells us in Philippians 2, 3, he says, Don't let anything be done by strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, esteem each other better than yourselves. It's interesting when we look in the scriptures just how many times strife is linked in the scriptures to envy and a lack of humility. Strife and conflict, they come from pride, envy, and the adversary. Peace comes from humility, love, and our Heavenly Father. Paul concludes his formula in verse 21. He says, don't allow yourself to be overpowered with evil, but take the offensive and overpower evil by good. You know, the world, the flesh, and the adversary seek to overpower us with evil. And Paul is telling us, don't wait for their attack. Take the initiative. Overpower evil in our lives by focusing on and doing good. And in this 12th chapter of Romans, Paul tells us how to take the initiative. If we follow his advice to the best of our ability, we will be successful. We will be transformed into the image of our Lord and Savior Christ Jesus, and we will hear the words, Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joys of thy Lord. And that is our prayer for each one of you. And may the Lord add his blessing.